There's a song in my soul And I feel it stirring in me This I know for sure That your love is like a flood And your mercy never ending I give my song to you And there's a joy in my soul
Hey, Deep Water, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, just take a minute and, and type in the chat where you're watching from, uh, where you're stationed at. Maybe you're watching from your bed or your living room, but we want to know what city, what part of the world you're watching from today. But we're just so glad that you tuned in, and we're going to experience an amazing uh, worship gathering together online. We're going to hear an amazing message from Pastor AJ. Uh, we're also going to uh, experience uh, music and worshiping and praising God together. But the most important thing we want you to know is that we love you, but more importantly, God loves you. And so I'm going to pray, and then we are going to begin this worship experience today. So let us pray together. Father, we humble ourselves before your presence this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to tune in and have the technology to, to gather as a community of believers. And we just ask that you would come, Holy Spirit, and dwell in us and with us. We pray that your word today, God, would challenge us, would convict us, and most importantly, would transform us from the inside out. God, we want to encounter your presence today, and may we leave this worship experience today better than when we logged on. This is our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art, thou my best thought, by day or by night, Wait Thy presence. 
So Paul has been addressing uh, a bunch of different issues with the church in Corinth, but they really all kind of boil down to this one issue of division, that they're, they're fighting with each other, they're divided, there's all kinds of disunity going on. And last week we saw how Paul was challenging them to kind of lay down their rights as those who are free in Christ uh, in order to be able to better serve and help uh, in the, the growth of their weaker or younger brothers and sisters in the faith. And particularly he's talking about laying down their right to eat meat sacrifice to idols. You can go back and watch the video from last week if that makes no sense to you. Uh, and then in chapter 9, he's going to start talking about how he lays down his rights as an apostle for the sake of those that he's trying to serve, for the sake of the mission that he's been called to. And then at the end of chapter 9, he's going to kind of pivot and start to talk more specifically about this idea of mission and how it's all about the mission and how everything we do has to do with this mission to help people come to Jesus, to help people have a personal relationship with Jesus, to help people find salvation in Jesus, to preach the good news. And, and at first glance, that can kind of seem like a, a curveball, like, okay, it was unity and division and unity and division and fights, and now we're all of a sudden on to mission. But it isn't. It, it, there's a very uh, direct connection between this issue of disunity and this issue of mission. And we're going to talk about both of those uh, tonight. So we're going to jump in. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'd encourage you to read 1 to 19 sometime. Uh, but we're going to read 19 to 23 together uh, today and talk about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse 19. Even though I'm a free man with no master, I've become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I, I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find some common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and to share its blessings. Let's pray. Father, help us today as we look at your word. Help us to understand what it is you're calling us to uh, in being on mission with you. Help us to be willing to uh, lay down our rights and our comforts and our preferences for the sake of the mission you've called us to. We ask this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Paul's been using himself in this passage as an example uh, to remind this deeply divided church that they're called to this mission. And he, he does this by beginning to illustrate, uh, you know, this idea of all that he's doing as a part of that mission. He's trying to say to them, look, it's not about Paul or Apollos. Remember, we started off talking about that. It's about Jesus. It, it's not about what meat you're eating or not eating. Ultimately, it's about Jesus. It's about his mission and about bringing people to him. It's about preaching the good news. It's the way we word it here at Deep Waters. It's about helping people become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And so he then challenges them to kind of follow his example and be on mission by meeting people where they're at, by meeting people where they're at. Paul's saying, look, when I'm with Jews, I, I meet them in that Jewishness. And when I'm with Gentiles, I, I interact with them. I meet with them on Gentile kind of terms. When I'm with those who are weak, I, I find a way to share that common weakness together with them so that I can lead them to Jesus. I find some sort of common ground where we can meet them. This is how, this is how missionaries think. Uh, you know, it, when you think about missionaries, they, they, they meet people on common ground. I mean, literally, like they go to some other country and, and geographically meet someone on common ground. They meet them on common ground linguistically, right? You learn the language of the people that you're trying to serve. Uh, they, they meet them on common ground culturally. You, you got to learn the, the traditions and the values and the stories that shape the way people think. That's kind of what missionaries do, and, and they do all of that so they can bring people to Jesus. But here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a missionary. You just are. You might not realize you are. 
you might not be doing anything about it, but you are a missionary. I don't mean a missionary in the sense of like the, the, the you know, uh, shirt from some other country and the slide projector and the table full of really weird stuff. If you grew up in church, you know what that means. If you didn't, congratulations, you're normal. I don't mean necessarily an, a, someone who travels internationally, but we are all, as followers of Jesus, missionaries in the sense that we are called to be on mission with Jesus. If God hasn't called you to go somewhere else on mission, that just means you're already where you're supposed to be on mission, right? It, it doesn't mean that, oh, okay, there's those who go and, th- and do and those who stay and do nothing. It's there's those who go and do and there's those who stay and do, but we're all called to be on mission. So the question again is not, am I called to be a missionary? The question is, what am I doing about it? Am I answering that call? But back to kind of missionaries, capital M, like cross-cultural missionaries, they invest a ton of time and energy in figuring out how to meet people where they're at, how to find that common ground, because they live with a constant awareness that they're foreigners. Like they're not from here, wherever that here is for them when they arrive on that mission field, as we always used to say. Here's the thing, though. Again, follower of Jesus, you're not from here either. You're not from here either. In 1 Peter 2, we're described as aliens and strangers. In Hebrews 11, we're described as foreigners and nomads. The truth of the matter is heaven is our home. The kingdom is our country. We're not really from here. You might have been born inside the city limits of Halifax. You might have been born anywhere else on the planet. No matter what, you're not from here if you're a follower of Jesus. Ultimately, you're from another country that you've yet to ever see. You're from the kingdom. You're from heaven. That's our new home. That's our allegiance. That's who we are. But because of that, sometimes it's easy for us to forget that as followers of Jesus, we're weird. Like we are. I don't, I don't mean we're weirdos, but I mean we're not normal. We're not typical, right? Like how many of your unbelieving friends regularly read a collection of books that are thousands of years old and then let them run that, that, those books run their whole life, right? Like it's just not normal. Like I, do, I doubt you have a friend who's like, oh yeah, every day I'm into the Iliad and the Odyssey and, and you know, Beowulf and I just, every life decision, that's right where I go. You know, like, no, of course not. You're weird. How many of your friends who don't believe in Jesus go, oh yeah, no, on on the regular, I'm aware of the presence of God and I hear him speak to me, right? Like that's crazy talk to people who don't know Jesus. How many of your unbelieving friends regularly get together with a group of people to talk about how an invisible, all-powerful being is transforming them internally? It's not a thing normal people do, but it's a thing followers of Jesus do all the time. By any objective standard of culture, guys, we're weird. We just are. If Jesus is the center of your life and he's your everything, there's going to be a lot of stuff you actually don't have common ground on with the people around you. So we have to realize that because that's not just a natural thing to have tons of that common ground, we got to find the common ground that does exist and lean into it and meet people on that common ground. we got to be intentional about finding those common experiences, those common backgrounds, those, those shared interests, and meet people there. That's why in Alpha here at Deepwater, we meet people in their questions. We go, big questions. That's something we both have. Let's meet there. That's why in CR, we meet people in their hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Because whether you follow Jesus or not, you probably got some of those. Let's meet there. In Riptide, we meet teenagers in their teenagerfulness, because that's just a whole other level of weirdness in life to be a teenager. And so we meet with teenagers there. We connect with them there. In your personal life, where are the places you can find common ground with people so that you can point them towards Jesus? Maybe if you're a parent, it's with other parents. Maybe if you're into sports, it's with other fans of whatever sport you're into. Maybe there's some other hobby. Maybe it's because you're in the same neighborhood. Maybe it's because you you, uh, work at the same place. Like Where are those places where you can find that common ground to connect with people and build relationship and kind of learn how to speak their language and help point them to Jesus. Find that common ground and do it. And when it comes to finding common ground, this is a a thing I think it's so important for us to remember is we don't need to make it any harder than it is for people to come to Jesus. So like originally, 
Christianity was a sect of Judaism. It was like a subset of Judaism that, that every Christian was a Jew. That there wasn't any non-Jewish Christians. It was just a kind of Jew. Like, what kind of Jewish person are you? Oh, I'm the Christian kind. Oh, okay. I mean, early, early days. But then the, the Holy Spirit starts speaking to these Gentiles. That's fancy speak for people who aren't Jewish. And the, the, God starts speaking to these Gentiles and calling them to him and filling them with the Holy Spirit. And it's like clear that these people know and follow Jesus. And so the church starts going, what do we do with this? Because don't you have to be Jewish and then become Christian? Like, isn't it like the, the 1.0 and the 2.0 kind of a thing? Isn't that a step one? Like one's a prerequisite to the other. And so they, they get all the leaders of the church together and have a good head scratch about it and go, all right, what, what's the deal here? This is the decision that they reach. This is Acts 15, 19 to 21. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath day for many generations. They're saying, look, guys, let's make it as easy as possible. Let's do everything we can to make it as easy as possible for people to come to Jesus while still preserving the integrity and the unity of the church, right? They're, they're going, this is already a pretty massive adjustment. This is already a pretty massive step. Why would we make it more complicated? Why would we make it more challenging? Why would we make it uh, more uncomfortable to do that? Which, again, is not to say make it as easy as possible, right? The elders in Jerusalem didn't go, I just tell them to do whatever they want, but say they like Jesus. You know, they said, no, here's, here's some stuff that both for your own spiritual maturity and the integrity of the church and the unity of the church, because there were still so many folks who were uh, highly observant of the Jewish law, these, here's some stuff you guys probably need to, to adjust to, but let's not make it any more difficult than it needs to be. Let's not overly complicate it. There's some irreducible minimums when it comes to following Jesus, but anything that's extra and on top of that, let's try to slip that, strip that away. That's why, again, at Deepwater, uh, when we attend worship, for those of you who are at home, uh, this is the biggest crowd we ever had uh, on a Thursday night. They're going to say something now, and uh, it's so fun, and we're we're, uh, I'm going to talk more about this at the end. We're working really hard to be able to reopen on Sundays, and we're, we're getting close. We're not there yet, but we're definitely doing something on Easter. I'll talk about more, um, more about that at the end. But when we come together to worship, right, uh, if, if, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, going to a church you're not used to is really weird. Like, it's uncomfortable. I'm a pastor. This is what I do all day, every day. I grew up it's so far in the church that if I was any further in the church, I'd be coming out the other side. Like, this is my, like, world. And I still feel really uncomfortable when I go to a church I'm, I've never been to before, where I'm not familiar with, especially if it's a, a, a denomination or whatever that I have less experience with. I'm, I'm kind of, oh, what's this going to be? How's it going to go? What are they going to say? What are we going to have to do? Imagine if you don't know Jesus at all, how weird that could be, how uncomfortable that could be, how, like, what, what's going to happen? What's, ah, you know? And, and why would we make it any more complicated than that by have an address code that we don't publish anywhere, but that everyone knows. And that if you show up and you're not dressed the right way, we're going, oh, what's this person's deal? What's their, you know, what's it? Or why would we not go out of our way to welcome people and let them know we're glad that they're here and, and pre-COVID shake their hand and now, I don't know, like a real friendly nod or whatever's acceptable with COVID, you know, restrictions. Like, why would we not go out of our way to try to remove that obstacle of awkwardness, of not knowing what you're supposed to do, of not knowing if, am I actually allowed to be here, you know? Like, why would we not do that? Why would we not do everything we can to make it easier for them? I'll give you uh, another uh, example of, I guess, yeah, I just want to say every, everything we do as a church should pass through that filter of, is this helping people come to Jesus, and is it making that as easy as it can be? With fidelity to the gospel, like, come into terms with the fact that you are a wretched sinner in need of a Savior is a big enough step. It is an uncomfortable enough realization. We don't need to add layers of foolishness on top of that, right? Let's stand by that, and let's strip away everything else that we can. I'll give you an example of what this looks like for me in my personal life. I am staunchly apolitical. You would, you would not be able to find someone who has any idea how I vote, or what party I like, or what politician I support. I'd never talk about it. You'll never find the person who goes, oh, yeah, I can tell you all about AJ's politics, right? On issues of justice, 
I am very prepared to stand up and speak out, but I'm standing with Jesus on his teaching, not with a political party on their platform. Because it is hard enough to get your head around Jesus. The last thing somebody needs is to go, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I also have to buy into this whole other separate political ideology in order to do that, right? It's, that's a big enough stretch to get your head around the theology, the stuff that's actually in the Bible, let alone all the minutia of political whatever that it really is not about Jesus. Again, there's issues of morality and there's issues of justice that we stand on, but not as political issues, as follower of Jesus issues. It's also, frankly, I think we lose our prophetic voice when we align ourselves with political partisanship. Because then we're just another person fighting for this side versus that side. I think the church, frankly, in a sanctified way, should say, no, we stand above all that and we speak the truth of God into these situations. Beyond that, the fact of the matter is, I'm not from here. You know, I talked to some of my international missionary friends this week and said, like, are you super involved in the politics where you live? And they're like, no, I'm not from here. I'm here on a mission to help people find Jesus. That should be true for all of us. We're not from here. I'm, again, I'm happy to engage with something that has political aspects when it comes to representing the cause of Christ and fighting for justice and things that make people's life better. But my hope for the salvation of this city, this country, this world is not in a politician, it's in a king. So, be on mission, meet people where they're at, don't make it any harder than it has to be. And here's the thing, if we'll be on mission like that, we'll find that the unity piece that starts to take care of itself, that, that the division and the fighting just starts to drift into the background. It is not a coincidence that Paul calls an incredibly divided church to be on mission, to renew their focus on the mission. Unity in the church flows from being on mission together. That mission gives us a united purpose to rally behind. It gives us something bigger than ourselves to care about. It compels us to choose, uh, to choose calling over comfort, to choose effectiveness over preference, to, to, to choose them and us over me and mine. In those times when the church has been the most dominant in the culture is when, are the times when we've been the most fractured. We call that Christendom. You know, think North America colonization through recently. When we've been in this zone where most people in a given area are, are mostly Christian, at least on some surface level, it would appear that the mission's pretty much accomplished, you know, and that's when we get up to foolishness. That's when the church gets fighting and nitpicking with each other and, and breaking apart and separating and, and get, we just got too much time on our hands, you know? People want to fight, and if you don't give them a mission to fight for, they'll just fight with each other, right? The, the building we're in right now, not the building you're in at home, this one here, this building was built by a church that belonged to a denomination who, at least at the time, their whole thing was they existed to baptize people who had already been baptized, but that they thought had been baptized wrong. Like, oh, that, that, that baptism what, doesn't quite count. There was something a little fishy with that one. Come here, we'll give you a good one. Like, that was their whole thing. Too much time on their hands. We're, we're a part of a denomination called the Wesleyan Church. There's been times in our not that distant history where, where we would have great, like, get all worked up into a froth about, is it a sin to play catch on Sunday? Because catch is like throwing a ball back and forth. That's kind of like a sport, and a sport's kind of an activity. An activity kind of sounds like work, and work is not rest. And Sunday's the Sabbath, and which it isn't, but <laughs> Saturday. Anyway, uh, and, and, and so is having a catch breaking the Sabbath and therefore sinful? Too much time on our hands, right? And we all oh, know those people, they're the types that they, I even heard they shot a basketball through a hoop on the Lord's day and we're better than that. I was like, really? Are there, is there not anyone left who hasn't heard about Jesus that we've got time to mess about with this foolishness, right? In the times where the church realizes that we have a world to save and a mission to fight for, all of a sudden we start seeing each other as allies, not enemies. 
right, as partners, not competition. And, and that division just starts to melt away. I have, I have friends who are, who are pastors and leaders who I, I connect with, who I, uh, you know, follow Jesus together with, many of whom I partnered with on some different kind of mission thing or another, uh, from uh, the following denominations. Wesleyan, obviously, Nazarene, Free Methodist, Pentecostal, Vineyard, Baptist, at least six different kinds, including independent fundamentalists, various other independent non-denominational, Mennonite, Brethren, Christian Church, Seventh-day Adventist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Congregational, United Methodist, United Church of Canada, United Churches of Christ, Anglican, both ACC and ACNA, if you don't know what that means, congratulations, you're normal, and Roman Catholic. We all have Jesus in common, and you would think that would be enough, but history has shown us again and again that it's not, that people can have Jesus in common and still fight with each other. What me and these other pastors and leaders and friends have in common that allows us to be in community with each other and support each other and work together on stuff is not just that we have Jesus in common, but that we're on mission together with Jesus. Because I think if the Jesus that we have in common is not the Jesus who's on mission, he's not the true Jesus anyway. Jesus is on a mission, and if you're not on a mission, you're not with Jesus. Like, he's going. you got to go with him. you got to keep up, right? When he calls the disciples, he doesn't say, like, hang out with me. He says, follow me. He doesn't say, like, can I sit here? He goes, like, get up. Come on, we're going. And they could go, I'll come with you, Jesus. But if they don't go up and go with him, they're not with him anymore, Right? When we are on mission together, when we're following Jesus with a shared passion and purpose, that kind of unity and cooperation just starts to come naturally. That's true, uh, you know, in big cross-denominational kind of things. It's true within kind of denominational families of churches, and it's true within individual local churches. Show me a church that's fighting over carpet colors, and I'll show you a church that's lost sight of the mission. Show me a church where there's constant tension about the style of the music, and I'll, f- I'll, I'll show you a church that stopped asking, how do we reach people, and has started asking, what would I prefer? Show me a church where everything is filtered through that question, how does this advance the mission God's given us? And I'll show you a church that has minimal drama, and when there is drama, they have both a framework and a motivation to work it out quick, because we've got a lot of work to do, and we've got to get back at it. We're called to be on mission. That means no matter how difficult it is, we figure out how to meet people where they're at. And it means we be, let ourselves be uncomfortable in order to make things more comfortable for them. And when we do that, our, our personal preferences and our, our petty disagreements just start to drift to the background, and we'll find ourselves more and more united as we go together with Jesus on mission. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you call us to a mission that you don't just save us and, and tell us to twiddle our thumbs till you get back, that you invite us to partner with you in the restoration of all things, that you commission us as your missionaries, sometimes on the other side of the planet, sometimes on the other side of the street, sometimes you send us to places we've never been, and sometimes you send us right back into the place we just were, but that we have a, a role to play on mission with you. Father, help us to be committed to that, to be dedicated to that, to be aware of the fact that when we get up and go to work in the morning, when we leave the house to go to the store, when when we show up at school, we're not just there to work or shop or learn. We're there to represent you and to encourage people in whatever ways you give us the opportunity to, to look to you and to share with people the good news of what you've done for them in whatever ways we can. Father, I pray that you would help Deepwater as a church to always be so focused on the mission that division and infighting and that kind of foolishness just never even seems like a thing to do. we got too much else going on. Father, I pray that you would help all of the churches who are faithful to you and your word, that we would be so about mission that we find it, even if there's some theological differences on some slightly less essential stuff, even if there's all kinds of stylistic differences or whatever else, God, I pray that we would be so focused on the mission that we find it pretty easy to walk arm in arm with each other and find ways to partner together and and be in step with each other to advance your kingdom in this world. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I could just sit 
I could just sit and wait for all your goodness Hope to feel your presence I could just stay I could just stay right where I am And hope to feel you Hope to feel something again
Imagine realizing you have no home to come to because it's been flooded, burnt to the ground, or demolished by a tornado, and that your whole neighborhood is in the same boat as you. Hi, I'm Christine, and I got a taste of what disaster relief is while volunteering alongside our ministry partner, World Hope, in the Bahamas after Hurricane Dorian. It was a challenging experience, yet a fulfilling one I will never forget. But when disasters happen close to home, how can we help? Here is a way. Reach Out is building a volunteer emergency disaster relief team through World Hope and the Salvation Army who will train deep water volunteers for free to help in Canadian emergencies while we are in a COVID-19 reality. And you can be part of it. The basic intro training shows just about how anyone in good physical shape and willing to rough it for a while can volunteer. It's online for only half a day and explains how help is needed in various roles and shows how to prepare and how to be put on the on-call list in your community. And that being on that list does not mean you have to accept any deployment. So, want to join me? Perhaps just do the intro training session and then decide. 
For more information or to get registered in an upcoming training session on a first-come basis, email reachout at deepwaterchurch.com. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a few uh, announcements before we head out. Uh, we are going to be live on Easter Sunday, uh, both... <laughs> yeah. We're going to be live right here at North Street uh, in Halifax at 9.30 and 11. You have to register in advance. There are capacity limits. Remember COVID? Uh, and so there's going to be a link below. You can sign up uh, for that. You can register for whichever one of those gatherings uh, makes the most sense for your family and schedule and whatever else. We are also going to be live over in Dartmouth. We are going to be at the former uh, First Baptist Church uh, building on Octorloney, also at 930 and 11. And uh, if you try to register in Halifax and there's not enough room, register over there. They've actually got more space. And uh, anyways, both those gatherings, our first Sunday live gatherings in over a year, uh, are happening on Easter Sunday. Make sure that you sign up. Make sure that you're there. There's going to be uh, programming for kind of preschool age kids. Uh, there's going to be nursery available, not staffed, but available if you have a kid you need to take out and change their diaper or whatever else. There'll be space available for that. We're not able to provide uh, programming for kind of elementary school age kids. There just isn't the space uh, and, and staffing and cleansing abilities and all that that are necessary at this point. But they're very welcome to come, hang out, be a part of the main gathering together. If you haven't been to church for a year, why not come as a family anyways, right? And uh, again, I want you to know too, we are working hard uh, on our reopening strategy. Uh, part of that is, is nailing down a permanent location that we can actually use uh, in Dartmouth and continue to figure out how to make this tiny space here uh, work. Uh, but Easter Sunday is going to give us a great test run at that and, and should position us to be able to reopen hopefully very soon. You keep praying that God provides us with the space that we need in order to do that. Uh, if Deepwater is your church home and you want to be part of the mission God's given us with your finances, helping to financially support the work that we do and, and uh, being a part of, of discipleship and worship through giving, uh, we want to encourage you to do that. There's a bunch of ways you can do that. The links to them are all down in the description. You can go to, I think it's deepwaterchurch.com slash give. Uh, all the ways there are to get money from point A to point B, we have available uh, e-transfer, check, uh, cash, uh, the, the rail car, uh, box of treasures. I don't, not really. Um, I got to quit saying that because I talked about silver bars one week and somebody dropped one off. But uh, we, we have direct deposit, pre-authorized debit, all that stuff. It's all down there. Just go look. You, you can read better than I can talk. Uh, and then uh, if, if this is one of your first times ever worshiping with us and you want to know more about who we are, what we do, how to get involved, the best next step for you to take is to sign up for our weekly email newsletter. It's called The Loop and uh, comes out on Tuesdays. And uh, any information announcements, that's how you'll look there to sign up for the Easter gatherings, all that. If you go, I don't know where the first Baptist building on Ocrelone is. Cool. It'll be right in there. Whole deal. The street address. You can put it into the Googler and it'll tell you how to get there. All that information is always right there. And the way you do that is just there's a link below. It's appearing as I do this. And uh, it says sign up for the loop or something very similar to that that you'll definitely be able to figure out. You can click on that, put in your name and email address. You'll be signed right up. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us. I want to invite uh, everyone here on Thursday, everyone at home, to stand for the benediction. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks so much for logging on. We'll see you next week. Thursday nights are great. <laughs> <laughs>